Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. The head of the Phoenix Union High School District has been selected to take over as superintendent of schools in Fort Worth, Texas. We'll talk to Dr. Kent Scribner about his new position, the current state of education in Arizona, and a whole lot more. And an exhibition following an artist's journey addressing issues of power and violence. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. We begin tonight with an update to a segment we did in June regarding the condemnation and possible eviction of families living in a trailer park in Mesa. City of Phoenix has been told by representatives of the owner of the Mesa Royale Mobile Home Park that the sale of the property has closed. Because of this new development, the city will work with the new owner, a company based in California, to make the most needed infrastructure improvements to the property. This means that the families who still live at the Mesa Mobile Home Park have been granted a temporary reprieve. Phoenix Union High School District is the largest high school district in Arizona. Dr. Kent Scribner has led the district as superintendent since 2008. He's been selected to take over as superintendent of the Fort Worth Independent School District in Phoenix. Joining me now to talk about his time in Arizona and new position is Dr. Kent Scribner, superintendent of the Phoenix Union High School District. Dr. Scribner, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you. Uh, it's a line I've used many times over the years. You've been a frequent guest, uh, recognized as, as uh, one of the most successful educators in the state of Arizona, and, and certainly uh, uh, the fact that you have been the superintendent of the largest school district in the state has, has been part of the reason why, why your voice has been so significant. Before we uh, get into the details of, of, of what's happened in the district and, and quite frankly why you're leaving, um, uh, give us a thumbnail sketch of the district itself. So Phoenix Union covers 220 square miles of central, south, and west Phoenix. It's a large uh, geographical space. Uh, I serve, uh, have served now for eight years as the superintendent of the high school district, all the, all the students, 9 through 12, 27,000 students. But we also have 13 different elementary partner districts, K through 8 districts, that uh, comprise in one, one uh, K-12 pipeline would be about 130,000 students. You came in 2008 there was turmoil. Tell us about that. Well, there, there was a great deal of turmoil and, and a changing demographic in terms of the student population. Uh, Phoenix Union serves a low income and, and language minority population. 84% of the students live at or below the federal poverty line. 81% uh, Latino, about 9% African American. And the, the district was experiencing real change internally. There was a us versus them culture between teachers and administrators, schools and community. And uh, I had been serving with, within the midst of, of Phoenix Union as the superintendent of the Isaac Elementary School District for five years prior to coming on to Phoenix Union. And what I found was a district that had great potential but needed to move away from focusing on adult issues and adult conflict and really get back to the, to the focus of, of preparing students for, for academic success. Now, as you prepare to leave, and, and I guess we should mention that it's not formal, formal. There's still some formalities right. that need to, to take place, but, but it's going to happen, <laughs> sadly, for Phoenix. Well, thank you. Um, uh, tell us what you view as, as the current state of the district. Well, when we started in, in 2008, um, I found a, a district who, like most urban districts, was starting to slide into what I would call the deficit model. How do we minimize student failure? The goal being high school graduation, focusing on metrics around, around minimizing student failure as opposed to maximizing student success. I was very fortunate to come on board at the same time of a, a, a progressive governing board which was focusing on college and career preparedness. In fact, they took the, the paragraph long run on sentence mission and vision statement and turned it into just one simple point, uh, mission statement, which was preparing every student for success in college, career, and life. We focused all of our efforts not on high school graduation and a 10th grade Ames test, but rather on how, what, what number and what percentage of our students were going on to college and were, were actually able to take uh, credit-bearing freshman uh, university or college uh, math and English courses. Uh, we had had several, several great initiatives uh, in that area. And so by those measures, how has the district changed in the time that you've been here? <clears throat> well, when I got there uh, and the board wanted this to adopt this new, this new mission of preparing every student for success in college, 
college, career, and life, uh, I asked the question, well, how many of our students took the ACT or the SAT the previous spring? And of about 5,000 juniors, only 340 had taken the test. So thanks to uh, several, a couple members in the legislature, David Lujan and Rich Crandall, and most importantly, the Helios Foundation, uh, we began in 2009 to offer the ACT test to all 11th graders uh, during the school day in April on a Tuesday at no cost to the students. And nothing, nothing that we've done uh, has, has helped us leverage the college and career uh, cultural transformation more than that. Uh, teachers starting asking the questions on, of their top students and what, 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 what grade were they getting on the ACT and how did that compare nationally. Students themselves were demanding a more rigorous uh, preparation for, 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 for college. Now we've got some pictures that illustrate some of, the, some of these items of success, the first one being a, a graduation ceremony, which right. I think ultimately is is the measure of success. How is the district doing there in terms of, of graduation rates? Well, graduation rates have, have climbed uh, uh, dramatically uh, in, 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 in the last uh, several years. Um, our focus, uh, despite the fact uh, that, 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 uh, that the graduation requirements have, have increased, we've seen, we've seen growth in that area, particularly for some of the subgroups. So, so the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Depart U.S. Department of Education asks us to, to measure, uh, make schools measure how they're doing with, based on gender, race, and ethnicity. And what we found in Phoenix Union, because we have high quality teachers, we have staff and, and support, serve, support staff that are culturally competent, if you're an African American student or if you're a Hispanic student, you have a better four-year graduation rate in Phoenix Union than you do as compared to the statewide average. That has to do with a lot of the the, 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 the wraparound services and, and support that we provide our students. And, and other offerings that you have, and there's been expansion in the district. We've got another picture here. Uh, I think this was the dedic uh, a, a new building that was, that was coming up. Yes, um, uh, JROTC is a, is a great program. We have, uh, we have several thousand students participating in that, and, uh, and our student population, uh, um, again, representative uh, of, 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 the, of the larger uh, student population. But, but those students in, J in JROTC are some of our highest achieving students, leadership capacity, going on to colleges and universities, really uh, demonstrating not only discipline in their extracurricular activities, but it also translates to the classroom. And I think we've got a picture of Frank, Franklin Police and Fire School. Right. Another initiative that we've undertaken is the, are the small and specialized schools. Now, now that, that began before my time, but we've we, we've we've really focused on on high achieving. And, and rigorous small schools because size matters. Bioscience High School, one of the top schools in the state. Franklin Police and Fire, another top school. We're, we're about ready to, to do a ribbon cutting at the Phoenix Coding Academy, a computer programming and coding school, uh, 400 student school right on the, uh, on the Central High School campus. We found that embedding small specialized schools within the large comprehensive high school system is the way to go because there are some students who want the large large uh, high school experience and others want a small, uh, we call them charter likes, uh, and, and, and our small specialized schools outperform any uh, um, of, 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 their, of their peer uh, schools. Now we have a picture of you with another very accomplished graduate, but not a Phoenix Union High School. He's somebody that, that we've seen here in the Valley on occasion or two, and this time he was visiting, I, I, I think more in connection with, with something going on with housing, but, but you've been actively involved in, in some of the initiatives of the Obama administration. Right. In, in 2011, I, I was asked to join uh, the, the President's Advisory Commission. Uh, it's a White House initiative on excellence for education for Hispanics. I'm a commissioner uh, who is serving in that capacity. It's a great experience with, with leaders from all over the, all over the country uh, and, uh, and really focusing on best practices for low-income and language minority students. And, and we're very, very proud in Phoenix Union to, to be able to, to tell some, some great stories of success. When we started this, we said we don't want to be like other large urban settings. We don't want to be like some of the challenges that are in in LA, in Chicago, in Philadelphia. Phoenix is different. And thankfully, uh, we have a governing board that was stable and a governing structure uh, focused on, on, on the right things, rigor uh, in the classroom, uh, uh, relevance and in instruction for our students, and certainly meaningful relationships uh, between adults and, and, and students. Which you've described in the past as the new three R's right. in education. Right. Uh, when, we were come, when you and I were going to school, it was reading, writing, and arithmetic. Today, it's, it's rigor. Um, uh, is curriculum challenging for students? Relevance? Does it make sense to students beyond high school when they, when they ask the question, why do I need to know this? We need to have an answer. And then relationships. Uh, the the, 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 the two-parent home 
uh, in a stable environment is not the norm across our society. So schools have to serve not only in the academic sense, but in the social and emotional uh, sense as well. And this last picture is a reflection of, of, of another success of yours. It's what I call the Phoenix Union goes to the movies right. picture. Uh, but but uh, and seriously, this, this is quite an accomplishment or reflects a, a major accomplishment right. of, of the schools. It's, it's another national story. Uh, the, the Carl Hayden Falcon uh, robotics team, an after school program of uh, four students, three of whom are undocu were undocumented. Uh, uh, and, and those students entered in, in, in a robotics competition at the UC Santa Barbara. And uh, the, they, they, out, they outperformed and they won the competition. I, by my, um, MIT was in second place and Duke was in third and Virginia Tech was in fourth and, and first place was Carl Hayden High School at 35th Avenue and, um, and Roosevelt. And Harvard was among the losers. They were also were. And, and it got made into a movie. That's why George Lopez is It here. did, it did. Uh, uh, George Lopez plays the role of Freddie Lejavardi, the, the teacher, and uh, Marissa Tomei is in the movie and, uh, and uh, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis is the principal and uh, I was hoping uh, Bruce Willis would be the superintendent but that, that, that wasn't the kind of case. Now we've talked about a, a number of the highs. Um, uh, let me ask you overall, um, the best and the worst moments in your tenure. The best and the worst moments in my tenure in Phoenix Union um, are probably the same. Uh, when we um, uh, experienced in 2009 the Great Recession and, uh, and the economy fell off the cliff and we had to cut, we cut 162 positions. So that was challenging, that was, that was more than challenging, it was devastating. Uh, we were able to, to save jobs and through attrition place people in years forward, but it was also the best Thing that happened to us because it forced us to identify and determine, take stock of where we were and determine what our core values are. And we were able to shrink programs. We had 700 programs and you know what, we probably only needed 70. S uh, school districts that are successful, like companies that are successful, do fewer things better. So it was both a blessing and a curse. Now, um people are concerned about your departure, what it means for the future of the school district. What do you have to say to them? Well, um, I've never applied for a job before this and when the, when the search firm and the headhunter uh, came and, and, and contacted me, uh, and if this hadn't worked out, I never would have applied for, for, for another one. I've, I'm very, very happy in Phoenix. Um, but uh, one of the reasons that, that, that I did continue the conversation is because this is the best leadership team that I've ever worked with. Um, our my assistant superintendents and associate superintendents are phenomenal. The district made a great decision in acting quickly and decisively and naming uh, Dr. Chad Guestin as the interim. Uh, it's my hope that he will remain uh, long term. He's a, he's a uh, bright and dynamic leader, uh, transformed Camelback High School now as a uh, director of school leadership supervising the principals and, and uh, one of our colleagues talked about hiring teachers. He said, I want, I don't know, I'm not only looking for, for a bilingual tongue, I'm looking for a bilingual heart and, and, and Chad has both. He's not Latino, which, which um, may be a, an issue for some in the community. What do you say to them? I say we want someone who's good for Latino kids, not necessarily the right, the right surname. Uh, my last name's not Latino either, but, uh, but uh, he, 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 is a, he is a dynamic leader, uh, a brilliant uh, um, um, uh, educator. He's worked, for, worked with me for 12 years in two different districts, and uh, Phoenix Union students and the community, I think, would benefit a great deal by the continued uh, upward trajectory. Urban districts are successful when there is stability in governance and leadership, and that's what we've been able to establish in Phoenix Union. Last question. Tell us a little bit about the district you're going to. Fort Worth Independent School District uh, is uh, uh, in the city of Fort Worth, uh, right next to Dallas. Uh, 86,000 students, uh, 143 uh, schools, uh, a, a district that's 75% uh, uh, low income, about 60% uh, Latino, 24% African American student population. One interesting feature about it, though, is, uh, is the business community is really, really engaged. And, and in some of the urban settings that I've talked about, the middle class has given up on the public schools. That hasn't happened in Fort Worth. And uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for, 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 for me to learn about the community and learn from, from, from those members who are, who are really engaged in schools and, and hopefully replicate some of the same kinds of things that that we're experiencing, that we, that we went through in Phoenix, in Phoenix Union. Dr. Kent Scribner, thanks so much for all your years here. Thanks for being a guest on our show, right. and we wish you the best of luck in Fort Worth. Thank you very much.
Watch sneak previews of what's coming soon to 8. Go to azpbs.org slash previews today. Landlocked is the first video survey of Mexico City-based artist Miguel Angel Urios. The exhibition follows Urios' journey into a unique artistic practice that addresses issues of power, apathy, and violence through original production technique. Joining me now to talk about the exhibition is artist Miguel Angel Urios and ASU Art Museum curator Julio Cesar Morales. Julio, welcome back to, to Horizonte. Uh, before we talk to, to you, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Urios, um, I'd like Julio, you to give us just kind of a sense of what the exhibition is about, and then we'll get sure. into a lot more detail. Well, thank you for having me again, and um, we have an amazing exhibition by Miguel Angel Rios, and it's uh, very unique because four of the projects are world premiere projects, they're uh, commissioned by the ASU Art Museum, and the rest is a video survey, so we have a total of 10 videos and two documentaries, and apart from that, we have what we call a process room where you actually see some of the storyboards, some of the ephemera that went into making all this work. So how does the video part work? When, 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 if I go as a, as a, a guest mm -hmm. to, to the museum, what will I see? You'll see this installation of, of a video, uh, a video space, and essentially it's an immersed sort of experience where the videos will move around you. So you'll have five different channels, five different video projections that would project the 10 different uh, video projects. And then you go upstairs to our top gallery and you'll see the ephemera, the photographs, the making of. In a way, I wanted to have the audience have the same experience that I had when I visited uh, Miguel Angel Rios in Mexico City and walk into his studio. So it's a very rare look into sort of the artist's mind, if you want to call it that. Senor Rios, um you're based in Mexico City, but you're actually originally from Argentina. You left uh, at the time of the, uh, the Junta when they took over. Yes, I am from North Argentina, and I left 75 to New York. And since then, I stayed over there for many years until the military left, and I came back to Argentina to visit the family, and then I returned to New York, where uh, I set up my studio and and I made myself as an artist. And as I understand it, uh, while you were an artist when you were living in Argentina, it was in New York that you kind of developed or, or, or redeveloped yourself into a, a, a different role. Yes, I decided that in New York I will start from zero and uh, study some master or some artist that I was just known by reproduction, like uh, Jasper Jones, Andy Warhol, Rauschenberg etc., etc., but after a year, I decided to look at my roots and to work with my environment and my open landscape where I come from. And we've got some pictures of, of, of one of the videos, two of the videos, actually. Uh, some of them are stills, and we've got one video uh, of, of an exhibition of, of one of the, the uh, items in the, in the exhibit, and we're going to put on screen now some of the Stills of the first couple of pictures, I think, simply reflect you working in a landscape setting. We've, we've got those pictures here. And, and this is, um, is this in Arizona or is this in, in Mexico? No, that one is in um, North Argentina in the Pre Cordillera de los Andes, the, where I was doing a video four months ago. And we've got a, a picture now that we want to put up on the screen of. of uh, Actually, I think we'll start with the video mm -hmm. of, of uh, some of these objects that are really uh, items from your childhood, as I understand it. Now, the balls. So what does that re reflect? Well, those um, came from a game that I used to play when I was eight years old in the open landscape, because where I come from is uh, it's almost a desert near of the La Cordillera de los Andes. And I used to play with a um, white rolling stone that we're looking around and uh, throwing down to the hill with another frame. And we make a line and the one who get closer, that was the, the winner. But after so many years that I was traveling around the world, I decided to work with that idea, but this has, very different levels. They could be people who are running from one country to another and also could be um, drugs that are uh, running from south 
to the north. And, and we also see some of them shattering, actually. And, yes. And what yes. does that represent? Failure? Or? Well, uh, this represents the, uh, you know, the substance. They are um, traffic from from Colombia, from Bolivia to to United States. I mean, it has different lectures. Not exactly about the drug. But when I did the video, I was thinking about that because they found many different ways in order to traffic with the drug from South America to the United States. Yeah, and I think an interesting thing is, you know, no matter how many walls you're building between the United States and Mexico and how many billions of dollars you're spending on it, I think what Miguel Angel is trying to say is that there's also creative ways in which they make these kinds of uh, drugs into the United States, which is the it's largest consumer. People and drugs are going to get through anyway. They're going to get through no matter if you spend $8 billion on a new fence. As, as we've heard recently from some proposals for post candidates. Exactly. Um, we, we've got some stills of, of this same uh, aspect of, of the exhibition we're going to put on the screen right now. And, and Julio, are, are, are these also in the ex? Well, you know, yes. And so essentially, Miguel Angel Rios uh, created 1,000 of these balls made out of a mixture of cement. No, 3,000. 3,000. 3, 3, and yeah. you see 3,000 balls in the video. And so in the um, process room, in the artist mind room, I guess we'll call it that. Um, you'll see some of the actual balls and the materials that were used in these videos. And you see them in flight. I think we've got you'll another picture flight, of, yes. of, of this uh, mm -hmm. scene when they're actually <coughs> up in the air. It's quite heavy. They're actually quite heavy. They're actually about 10 pounds each. Something like that, yes. But mm -hmm. the idea about those is to work in the open landscape, uh, how you can uh, make an attraction of the landscape and, and see how the, the rolling stone, white stone, are the protagonist, which is a little bit difficult, but since I use 3,200, we are able, able to do it. These are magnificent pictures, mm -hmm. and, and, and that, that's one of the right. videos. Uh, we have another video that represents, uh, and this one I think is uh, from Mexico, from the state of Oaxaca. Uh, we've got a couple of stills from, from that one that we're going to put up on the screen right now. The, the, the first one is... Ghost of Modernity. Uh, the cost of modernity the, is the, the ghost title of, of modernity. Yeah. yeah. So here's one picture. What does this represent? When the ghost of modernity is about uh, there is a, a cube which is the icon of the most famous in the in the in the art world, but mostly they work with that idea, the white cube, and I was trying to make this uh, icon. Uh, to go for another space, which is about pover poverty in South America. And uh, why I call the ghost of modernity? Because he never touched the land, always is like uh, floating. floating around the poverty in, in Mexico and Oaxaca, the play where I did is in Sachilla. And I think what's important is that the play is also on sort of the failure of modernity in certain regions of Latin America, but also the videos filmed in the dump. In the and we've dumps. got a picture of, of women yes. in the dump. Yeah, and as I understand it, this is the way they dress and this is what they do. They're, they've got brooms there. And, well, and I'm sorry, that particular thing is, was because in the morning when I wake up and in the morning I saw the woman uh, sweeping. sweeping the the garbage not to invite their house. And I say that's a fantastic idea to be able to do a, sh a shooting, and I did. And I talk with them like a twelve, mostly of them they dress in, in black, like you can see with the hat. Yeah, this wasn't staged. That's the way they dress. Yeah. Yes. And and these are people that live off the dump, so they live off recycling the leftovers of whatever everyone basically is throwing away. Julio, we're almost out of time. Sure. Tell us, uh, um, some of these were commissioned videos? Yes. And, and um, uh, this represents a, a project you've been working on for three years? Mm -hmm. So my, you know, this is my third year anniversary. I just got an email today from ASU. But essentially, the first project I was working on was this project for the last three years we've been working to have this exhibition. We got a fantastic grant from the Holly Foundation. And essentially, this um, really is an important exhibition um, for Phoenix, for the world, the art world, 
to have an amazing artist um, to be here and work with us. And, and it's a great exhibition and an artist of your caliber. I mean, Julio had told me that you are a great influence of, of many artists and I hope people get out to see the show because it's terrific. Thank you so much Thank for joining so us much. on Horizonte. And that's our show for tonight from all of us here at Horizonte and Arizona PBS. Thank you for watching. I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.